think we have everybody here. So I will go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody. So I'm Ashley Althoff. I'm the communication specialist for the Clayton County Energy District. I'm excited to have you here today for the for our Clayton County Clean Energy District Clean our sorry, our Clayton County Energy District Clean Energy Virtual Tour for community leaders. Just some housekeeping tips before we get started. As we go through the tour, we'd love for you to keep your video on so this can be more of a formal tour and kind of just close to the real in-person deal as possible. We'll have you remain muted until we open up for questions. Unfortunately, could not have this in person this year, but we wanna make it as interactive as possible. So we kind of have our smaller personable crowd here. And we're very pleased that all of you could be here because you're the community leaders that can make these clean energy differences and inspire others. So today in our audience, we have a good group. We have some state reps and candidates. We have, um, for the candidates for Iowa State, we have Mike Tapscott and Mike Klamesh. Uh, District 56 state rep candidate, candidates, we have Ann Osmondson and Mike Bergen and Kayla Cater. And then representing the city of Elkader, we have Jennifer Kauser, who is the city manager, and then Father Son John Hawk, who is pa the pastor. Representing Guttenberg, we have Bill Femelt, the mayor, Jane Parker, the hospital plant operations coordinator and city council member, and then Emily Yadoff, the community vitality director. For Strawberry Point, we have Lindsay Martin, who is with economic development. And then we have Troy Heller, who is the Starmont superintendent, and Shane Walls, who is the Clayton Ridge superintendent. And then with the Clayton County Development Group, we have Darla Kelchin, who is the executive director for that. Um, so I will start our presentation here. Um, so the Clayton County, with the Clayton County Energy District, our mission is to strengthen our community by leading, implementing, and accelerating the inclusive, local, and clean energy transition. And we put our bo boots on the ground in Clayton County to positively affect the local economy and reduce the energy costs, slow climate change by promoting wise energy use. And we wanna include everyone, electrify everything, and decarbonize electricity. So to comprise up the Clayton County Energy District, we have a board. Our chair is Dr. Jim Osterhaus, who will also be a presenter today. Our vice chair is Randy Lenth. Our treasurer is Elaine Funk. Secretary is Dr. Ken Zeichel. And then we also have Ron Kaiser and Tom Klingman and Kathy Cater. And then our program manager is Jolene Jansen, who will also be a presenter today. And then I am the communications specialist once again. Um, so starting off today's topics, we have three different topics. Each one will kind of have its different time slot. And then afterwards we'll have five to 10 questions. And that's kind of when we can, or five to 10 minutes of questions. So we can kind of open it up to you guys after those presentations and keep the questions fresh. And then if there's any more questions afterwards, we'll kind of have a round table discussion after all the presentations. So our first topic is St. Joseph's Church in Alcatar, which has their energy efficiency story. Our second is the Marquette City Solar Energy Transformation. And our third is the electric vehicle transportation in Clayton County's tourism sector. Um, so we'll start off with St. Joseph's in Alcatar and their energy efficiency story. Our presenters for there will be the business manager for the Emmaus Pastor at Sandy Claus. And then we have the pastor, Father John Hagen, and the in summer intern that we had this past summer, Alyssa Corkery. So we'll start out with Alyssa here, and she's going to tell us a little bit about cool congregations and what that's about with the churches. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, like Ashley said, my name is Alyssa Corkery. I'm a senior at Loris this year, um, and I had the wonderful opportunity to intern with uh, the Clinton County Energy District this last summer. And my main, uh, my main goal, my main focus, um, what I was working on this past summer is I was trying to kind of introduce cool congregations um, to five different parishes uh, within Clayton County. And so basically what cool congregations is, it's uh, a, a religious response to global warming. 
And what it's trying, what the program tries to do is help um, congregations or faith communities measure their carbon footprint and then work to reduce that by at least 10%. That's kind of like the very first goal that they have. And so one thing that's really helpful about cool congregations is they have a lot of materials um, on how to do that, what to look at, um, different tips on how to measure your footprint. They have a calculator online um, where there's a little worksheet and it tells you exactly what you need to kind of gather information wise. So looking at like your energy bills, how, how, many, how much energy have you used in kilowatt hours? Um, how much paper supplies, like paper products do you have to buy for the offices? Or what's your water bill looking like? And all of those things. And then you can write all of that down and then you plug it into an online um, on the website and it calculates then roughly what the, um, the faith communities, whether it's a church or a mosque or whatever, um, like their kind of community site. And then you can measure uh, the church's carbon footprint or the community's carbon footprint. And then the goal is after you have that baseline measurement of how much, um, how big of a carbon footprint that the, that the community has, um, they have different kind of goals as far as reduction. So there's a 10%, 20, 30, and 40%. Um, and after um, a church reduces successfully by 10% and can document that, um, you can then apply for cert uh, certification through um, Interfaith Power and Light, which is the organization that, that kind of runs the Cool Congregations Project. Um, and one thing that I think is really cool with the certification is it kind of gives folks um, within the community something like a goal to work towards of that 10% reduction, but then something to say like, look, this is something that we've accomplished. And then you can kind of start conversations within, uh, within the community with the, the say like church members or what have you uh, surrounding um, sustainability and saying like, look, if we were able to do some of these changes within the church, um, think of what you could do like within your own homes and kind of having that ripple effect of starting the conversation uh, around sustainability within the community and interfaith power and light is also really big on connecting um, personal values and faith values and so looking at, um, okay, how, how do I feel called, do, or do I feel called by my faith to make sure that I am personally cutting down on my carbon footprint and making sure that our church is running as sustainably as possible. And so kind of going beyond, okay, let's check this off. Let's do some LED transitions. Um, let's do these like things just to reduce our footprint and kind of having that wider conversation about sustainability within the parish. And so that's just a little bit of an overview of Cool Congregations as a whole. And I think I'm gonna be passing it on to um, Sandy and Father to kind of unpack a little bit of what happened specifically at St. Joe's, St. Joseph's, excuse me. Father John, do you want to unmute yourself? There we go. I think. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, yep. perfect. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks, Alyssa. That was really helpful to get the context uh, of, of some of this too. And good, Loris grad, good, good for you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a couple things that I would say just to, for starting out, I come at this a little differently because my dad was an HVAC guy at John Deere's. So he was always checking uh, to see that uh, uh, hot water heaters weren't running too hard and, and uh, trying, to, trying to do things efficiently. So I've kind of always looked at that. I will admit I wasn't in El Cater very long before Jolene got after me and started saying, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about this? What about this? What, you know? So she was really good about that. Um, the things that I had um, uh, on the top of my list were the things that every time really I go to parishes, we've got five of them together, is usually lighting and heating are huge issues. All of these buildings are, uh, they're just designed to be inefficient. Stained glass windows are not good. Insulation isn't good. Attics are terrible. And um, so one of the things that I noticed when I first got to uh, El Cater was that their HVAC system ran 
365 days a year. The blowers were running all the time, whether it was AC or whether it was heat. There were five thermostats in the building, uh, in, the, in the worship place itself. And on Saturday nights, after we were done with church, I would turn them all down as low as they went. And if you come back in on Monday, it was still hot in there. And I thought, okay, something, something's not right here. Uh, so um, we had, uh, the first thing we did was to uh, go through and put in a programmable thermostat. And the ones that we have uh, can be controlled on your phone. So you can check it all the time uh, and make sure that the, and so they were not only now programmable, but the biggest difference was, is that the blowers now weren't running 24 seven. They only uh, ran when it was called for heat or called for uh, cooling. And so that made a big difference for starters. Um, secondly, the fixtures in a lot of these churches, as you look at our picture here, these lanterns, most of them were set up with a center socket that would have, that would usually take a 300 watt light bulb and then three 100s around that. And so you're looking at 600 watts for each of those fixtures. So they were really sucking a lot of energy. And so we did some due diligence to find out. And then uh, really it was relatively simple for us um, to replace the large LED. And I, I, I was trying to look it up, but I think that these are 16 watt uh, versus 300, uh, I think were, was what they were. And then the the bulbs, the upper lighting, uh, we put in the um, uh, equivalency LED ones around there. And um, I, I remember talking to the bookkeeper after we did that. And I said, you know, I just want you to start to check to see because I can't believe that this isn't going to make a big difference. And she started to report to me within a couple months that it was, as you can see by our, uh, our stats here, that it really did uh, make a big difference. Uh, in doing that. Now, one of the things that came up in the process of this um, for the HVAC is it's, it's very clear that we need to replace our ventilators. Um, they're very inefficient. The motors uh, draw a lot of current. And um, so even with the current uh, HVAC system we have, uh, we would, we're, we're going to need to start taking a look at replacing the 11 ventilators in there. Uh, with something that's much more energy efficient. So that's on our radar for sure. Um, the other thing that that uh, that happened kind of in the midst of this is our hall needed to be redone. The hall was the original church in Ocator and um, it had fluorescent lighting in it, uh, which was very poor and a lot of the ballasts were out. And um, so when the hall was redone and re-insulated on the top part, uh, they put uh, LED lighting in which of course the women who do crafters in there as well as anybody else who uses the hall are very grateful for because not only is it a lot brighter but there's also dimmers on them. And so that's made a, a big difference. We did leave, reinstall the ceiling fans in there because we felt like that was really helping to uh, continue to uh, make it a more efficient room as well as in church, we had the ceiling fans that, that we use there uh, particularly in the winter time to make sure that the heat doesn't all stay up at the top. So. Um, it really was relatively painless. I wish I could tell you that my main drive um, was from an ecology uh, perspective. It was just trying to save money. And of course that does that. And uh, so the more education we do, I would say the weakest part of what we've done is I'm not sure how much our parishioners are aware of all this. Uh, certainly finance committee is, certainly people on the council uh, get reports about that. But we really need to, to take that another step now as we continue to work on this. So um, I guess those would be my initial things that I would offer. And just, uh, just start, so you kind of get an idea of cost when the replacing the, um, the thermostats was $295, replacing the lights was $218. So really relatively inexpensive, uh, a total of 513. And, uh, you know, we're seeing cost savings through that each year. So um, i sure a good project. Yeah. So I, I have a couple of um, follow-up points. So first I want to mention that Interfaith Power and Light is a, is a national um, nationwide nonprofit organization with statewide chapters. And they're, they're, they're basically all about care for our common home. And um, the, the energy district movement 
um, is kind of um, follows what not what is offered through Interfaith Power and Light um, because the missions line up. Um, a couple of years ago, and you'll hear a little bit more about this, the Energy District offered a um, a non-taxable uh, solar powering power for non-taxable entities, but it also um, when you're talking about solar powering, you're also talking about in the clean energy tr transition, we're also talking about, um, you know, investment in renewables, but also energy efficiency. And so um, before a church like St. Joseph's or any of the churches um, could consider investments in renewables, um, they would want to reduce before they produce. They want to make their, their house um, as energy efficient as possible. And then the, the deal that goes on with that is, is that, um, yeah, of course, you're looking at the, the economics of it. Um, that just makes, it, it makes any organization cash flow better. But by, re, by reducing the energy consumption, we're also reducing our carbon footprint, which goes to care for our common home. So it, it's a win-win. Um, and I have a question though regarding, so the, the one, the screw in LEDs in the, in the church um, was one part of the project. And then the Springs, um, Father and Sandy, I, I, the, like Father had mentioned, they, um, we redid um, the, uh, the church hall. Was that LED project um, just plug in LEDs or was that replacing ballasts? Um, well, that was all fixtures. Uh, I don't think there's any ballasts in these new ones. These are the same ones that the high okay, school. Okay, so they were yep. re rewired, correct? Rewired the whole thing, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So, what do you know um, off the top of your head what the price tag was on the, the ceiling house? part of that was? Um, yeah. No, not off the top of my head. We would have that as part of the bid that we got, but I can't tell you right now. So did you, Sandy, I know you and I talked a little bit about taking advantage of the um, utility rebates that were av available. Is, was that part of that project? To You know, not not part of this project back in 1617. Um, no, we, I'm talking about the one in the hall. I'm oh, sorry. in the hall. Yeah. The yeah. Yes, we did take advantage of those rebates. And um, yes, we did. So... I mean, you, you can't, can you come close to guessing what the, to replace all of those, to put in all new fixtures in the hall with rebate? And obviously I, you're not aware of the, the payback yet. Um, no, no, uh, no, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head either. I'm sorry, Jolene. That's okay. That's okay. So we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, but those projects like that, when you can, you can take advantage of some utility rebate rebates on those um, lighting projects and, and, and just look at what just happened with, you know, putting the programmable thermostats in and replacing LEDs in the church. I mean, that's a significant reduction in energy costs. And so in the end, when we're saving in our churches, that puts us more on mission. And that was kind of the, the point of that workshop is, is that, um, spend less on your energy bills, have more for your mission, whether it's, you know, care of God's creation, care of God's people. Um, but this is a good way um, to get on mission is to spend less on our energy. And that would be a good thing for us to have that information anyway, as we try to continue to educate the parishioners. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, thank you guys. Does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask? You can go ahead and if you want, go ahead and unmute yourself and other than replacing some of your, your blower fans and your ventilation system, are there other improvements that this project has made you look look forward to in the future or things that you're thinking you want to continue on? Oh. oh, Father, you're muted. Father, you want to un unmute yourself, Father John? There we go. There you go. Uh, I think two of the things that we are, uh, that are begging some uh, research and some discussion now is um, as we do that, uh, both geothermal and what, what are we looking at as far as possible solar applications? Um, it's a little trickier in El Cater uh, than some of our other churches because that's uh, on the National Historic Register. So we have to kind of watch the things we do with that. But we have a lot of space on that campus. So we can see. Yeah. 
Okay, does anyone else have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Father John and Sandy, for joining us. Yes. So there, they, um, I'm, and maybe we, I should just wrap that up real quick. So their um, cool congregation certificate is essentially in the mail, um, but they will have that, um, that claim to fame. And Alyssa spent, like I said, this summer having conversations with several churches in Clayton County. And um, we will have somebody, hopefully Alyssa, but somebody that will continue the con conversation next great. summer. And it'll be great to use St. Joseph's as that example of, you know, look, a couple thermostats, um, put some LED light bulbs, you'll get that certificate, and then it's a level deal. So the next project that St. Joe's does or has already completed um, will just lead to another level of becoming an even cooler congregation. And, um, and the story will continue and be told to the parishioners. So it's, it's really good and encourage that at home as well. So, yeah. All right. All right. Thank you guys. Okay, so we will head Thanks, on. Thanks, Alyssa. Yep, feel free to pop off. Appreciate your time. All right. Okay, we'll head on to the Marquette topic. So Marquette did an amazing solar energy transformation. And the mayor, Steve Weipert, and city clerk, Bonnie Baseman, will be giving us more, a lot more information about that. But, um, oh yeah, but first Jolene is gonna talk a little bit about the power purchase agreements. And we also have a short little video to go along with that. Yeah, um, so we're gonna um, essentially, um, a, a big part of the work that we're really doing and encouraging within the energy district is that, you know, strengthening our communities by local investments in renewables. And, you know, it, it's very difficult. Um, there's a little bit of cash outlay when it comes to um, investing in solar. Um, and so communities have to just, you know, look at their, look at their finances, look at their situations, look at the siting um, to site in solar. Um, and obviously that whole idea of reducing before they produce, but the city of West Union is a city that um, actually attended that same workshop that I mentioned earlier in 2018, um, solar powering for non-taxable entities. And you know they were trying to figure out how they could um, really reduce their energy costs by investments in solar, but didn't have the cash um, to go out and just buy solar um, up front. So they they have financed in West Union, and you'll see in this video here um, a, through both the school district North Fayette Valley and um, the city of West Union. They financed um, over um, I think about 700 kilowatts of solar through a, something called the Power Purchase Agreement. And it's a little different um, financing scheme than what's going on in, in Marquette and um, a little less on the payback um, because of that, but they didn't have the, the um, cash flow to the capital to go out and purchase right away. So this is what we put in, the energy districts put on, are doing a kind of a series of these energy district tours um, throughout all of the energy districts. There's nine of us now um, that are countywide energy districts. And so this is one that the Winnesheek Energy District did um, last, um, uh, two weeks ago now, or three weeks ago um, over in West Union, sort of showing the Winnesheek um, Energy District, or excuse me, Winnesheek County leaders, uh, what it means to actually have community owned solar. Not everybody can afford to put solar on their rooftops, but if their city, invest in solar, then they as residents actually own solar as well. So let's just play this, Ashley, and sort of tell the story of what happened over in West Union before we move to Marquette. I just wanted to let everybody know that West Union is very fortunate to have the opportunities it does with solar energy. Our school system and city government has taken on the role of implementing solar energy into our community. Our city has aggressively taken uh, solar, solar generation on as an endeavor. Um, 
really, we might as well harness the use of the sun. If it's here, let's use it. If we have the land where we can put up the, the solar panels and we have the investors who are willing to, to, to work with the city on that, it's kind of a no-brainer. I don't see why more communities don't do it. This tax credit has really helped to kick in the area. Oh, as we look at savings, uh, working with our PPA partner, uh, we're going to estimate that we're basically are going to reimburse him about 10 cents a kilowatt, which is a savings for us of about five to seven cents a kilowatt. Uh, through this first initial six years of the 25-year contract. At the end of six years, the city will have the option of uh, purchasing the system at a fair market uh, value, at which time then we would have 100% of that uh, savings um, coming our way at that point. So we project here over the next uh, three to five years that we should be hitting $35,000 to $40,000 of savings per year for the city. And then of course, at one point or some point when we do purchase the system, um, then we would collect uh, somewhere in that 60 to 85,000 range per year of savings be, uh, being on solar. Yeah, so this slide is not easy to read or see, but essentially it defines what a power purchase agreement is. And, and um, as some of the um, West Union leaders were explaining, essentially they, they put up solar um, and they found an investor that would actually develop the, um, the solar for, they have, they have um, solar on their swimming pool on North Fayette Valley, all of the schools in the North Fayette, North Fayette Valley system are powered by solar. The city library, um, street, the street lights, um, the fire station, the street shop, the maintenance shop, a well, their county shop and city hall. And then also they have another well that's on the fairgrounds and then a lift station. So again, that's a, that's a lot of investment in solar. Um, and in order to make that happen, they found an investor that has a tax appetite, um, meaning they, they could, um, they needed tax credits. And so they were this third person actually then finances and owns the solar, this, this investor, this third party. And then they, they, the panels produce the power that are needed to power these operations. And uh, so they sell that electricity to the city entity at a reduced rate as to what it would cost to buy it um, from, the, from the utility. So uh, Nick McIntyre, the, um, uh, the city manager there mentioned that, you know, they, they're able to get it somewhere around a 10 cents a kilowatt hour versus paying the utility around 17 cents. So there's, there's a significant savings there. The, the um, third party is able to then um, realize those tax credits. And then in about six years, they'll entertain the idea of buying, the, the city will buy some of those um, projects outright and then get the full, all the, all the um, power at, 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 at no cost. So you can go ahead there. Ashley. So that's what a power purchase agreement is. Based on the projected cost savings that we're working with Gary uh, Novak on, we think we're going to be able to save between forty-five and fifty-five thousand dollars a year um, while we're in that power purchase agreement. Uh, one of the uh, things that has us particularly interested is, is once that's finished, we could potentially see that move up to uh, double, if not triple those figures. So that power purchase agreement, I believe, is a four and a half or five year uh, rotation. And once we would be able to purchase that out, uh, we would be able to save that amount of money out of our general fund. It's nice because they are strictly usually on a very tight budget and you're allowed to work with them to come up with your plans to um, help them either have a long-term BPA agreement uh, if they don't have the ability to look at buying that out or some that have the ability to set some funds aside and, and see that game to be able to own it themselves in eight to ten years. I just learned that they're doing a fantastic job leading in, in Fayette County and it's really cool to see the way our communities are stepping up and, and saving taxpayers money 
The solar systems we have in Elma are for the uh, city sewer plant and the city well house, the, the, our pump house. Um, we will be installing solar on our medical clinic that is just going up. That should be starting next week. And then we will be installing solar on a renovation that we will be hopefully starting in a few months for our library and city clerk's office and community room and a daycare addition. We are trying to be more uh, uh, aware of our surroundings uh, and our impact on the environment. And solar is definitely just a clean source of energy. So we want to be part of that movement along with our geo that we have in our downtown uh, business district. Anything we save obviously is gonna be good for our community, right? And we can take that money and it's gonna go into our general fund. So that'll help fund, you know, we can use it for street work. We can use it for uh, a lot of different things because it's general fund money. And the best part of it is it's gonna help keep our tax levy down to a nice manageable amount. Okay. So I will go on to Bonnie and Steve here who will talk about their, so a specific Clayton County solar example. And like Jolene said, they did not use the power purchase agreement, but they said they definitely would have used that option if they did not have the money to purchase it outright. So Bonnie and Steve, I will let you guys take the lead here and start out with kind of why, why you decided to choose solar for Marquette. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Um, it all started um, in 2018 when Clayton County Energy District had a um, non-taxable entities workshop in El Cater. Um, I went to that with our um, wetland center director, um, Alicia, and um, it was very informative. Um, we were able to talk and meet with vendors there. Um, and then I came back and started talking to the public works superintendent, Jason Sullivan, about, hey, is there any place in Marquette where you think solar might work? And he suggested our well number four. It had good southern exposure. It had lots of extra um, land. And so we started looking at it. Um, we did, we contacted three of the vendors that we had met at the workshop. Um, and, and started from there, it was a pretty easy process. You just send them your electric bills and, and then the contractors and vendors usually do the work. And I went, I'll go back to the other slide. So you did end up going with Eagle Point Solar out of Dubuque. Yes. And you said that was a, that's been a super easy, smooth process. Uh, yeah, they're very helpful. They, you know, you just send them your electric bill they come out and take a look at the site for no charge. Um, they put together a presentation on how much they think they you can potentially save. Um, they're willing to come and they talk to council. Um, we had two different uh, installers come up and give a presentation to the council. And I think that just Eagle Point just seemed to be the most comfortable people to work with. They answered tons of questions. They, he would come back at every council meeting month after month, it seemed like, and be asked the same questions and give the same answers. And I think it just took a while for the city council to kind of be bought over that this was a good idea. Let's hop in here. Yeah, the new project took a few months um, for city council to get on board with. Um, but then once it was done and they realized what the savings was by the next budget year when we were when we were sitting down doing the budget and they realized how much money they were saving on electric costs annually, they came back and said, well, shoot, can yeah. we use this on every time we, we were talking about a different building, they'd say, can we use solar on that project? <laughs> Just um, so we started looking at other facilities. Um, 
Eagle Point came out and they actually gave us a proposal on six different things. We looked at the city hall building, um, another well, and that's what led to um, the wetland center, the police station and the sewer plant. Um, so those were the projects that we did um, in last year. Yep. Might have taken a little while to get the council on board, but once they could actually see the first project done, then they were as excited as we were to continue forward. So yeah, here obviously pictured is the Driftless Area Wetland Center and then their shitty city shop and police station. And then this is the meter that was on the, um, behind the city shop building. And I kind of ask you guys if you had to know anything about how to operate the solar if you had to train anyone in the city but you said that Eagle Point the solar installer has been really great with kind of managing that and it doesn't it doesn't really add any extra maintenance for you guys for the city of Marquette no no, no. Um, there's an app online so you can actually log into the app and you can watch how much solar you're generating in a day or by month or however you want to kind of track it. Um, the wetland center is our environmental educational area. Um, they love the solar. Their electric bill now is $15 a month. Um, and it, it just is encouraging for them out there. Alicia really enjoys knowing that solar is heating their building. Yeah, and it's not pictured on here because the solar panels are actually right on the top of the building. They kind of, the way that the building is, the architecture of it, it kind of blends right in, but it definitely goes with the space. Um, yeah, and then here's the sewer plant, which this is your biggest array. This is, And this is the last one you installed, correct? That's correct, yes. And this one is like kind of right when you come inside of Marquette at a, open location and there's so you can see there's lots of options there's where you can put it on a roof where it's um, this one was put right into the ground because the ground was stable enough there or soft enough to actually get into and then this one they were able to use they put the concrete blocks on and then Jolene provided us with this awesome picture to kind of see the array from the background and just kind of a great way to get excited about the future. And um, I don't know, I think it's just something that we will start seeing more of. We uh, did it with um, the solar array for the sewer plant is on um, Department of Transportation property. Um, and so we did get an easement from them and we worked with the DOT um, because of the ground was so rocky. We went with the concrete ballasts um, instead of the metal poles that bore into the ground. There's um, 392 panels that offset the electricity for the sewer plant um, at a 76% efficiency. Um, so that will save the city of Marquette a lot of money and electricity just in the sewer plant alone. We had a lot of council members that were concerned about the aesthetics of driving into Marquette and your view would be blocked and you might not get to see the hills quite as quick as you normally would. You don't even know it's sitting there. People come to town and you ask them about it. Well, I didn't notice it. So it, it actually, it just kind of blends right in. We're pleased that the DOT was willing to work with us. The city council really approved the projects um, because of the money that they would save on um, electricity. Um, the added benefit of the number of trees that they're saving and lowering the carbon footprint is a plus, but it came down to the fiscal responsibility to the taxpayers, keeping the property tax lower and the water rates lower. Um, they did at the sewer plant project, they did look at the PPA um, but then at the end, they chose to, to do the capital outlay um, because the savings was significant. So. so if we look at that sewer 
plant project alone that was a that the um the cost of that project was just over three hundred thousand dollars right yeah Steve? Correct. yep and so then the cash gain on a on investing in solar so how it, it, and it powers let me get that straight too it's about 70 percent of the demand needed for the sewer plant right if we go way right. to the bottom of, line of that Yep. So the cash gain in 25 years um, is almost three quarters of a million dollars right there in sa tax savings. And because, you know, they're going to have to pay the pay the electricity bill in order to operate a sewer plant and provide that city amenity. Um, I can't imagine a modern city without um, being able to have the sewer services. So a $300,000 outlay, outlay will be paid for in 10.6 years. And the cash gain on that is three quarters of a million dollars. Is that, do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And the, the, percent of, the percentage of electricity um, is really um, mandated by Alliance Energy. Kind of they come, they look at the electric and then they're the ones that kind of say what efficiency can be at that project. That's why they're all different. The 83%, the 84% at the wetland center, and so that 72% was is really kind of determined between um, Eagle Point Solar and the Alliant Energy somehow. Yeah, um, yeah, it, yeah. That's part of part of the net metering regulations, um, and they do get to yeah s s cap the size of the system. Um, but at at the same time, um, that investment is means what for your for the residents of, of the city of Marquette? Well, we were looking at probably a 25 to 30 percent increase in sewer rates. Okay. And now that's gone there. They don't have to worry about that increase. And, you know, the water is making money now just by the solar installation. Sewer is going to be pretty close to breaking even. But if we do look at a rate increase, probably be like two or three percent. That's much different than 30. 30, right, yeah. Two or three percent, they don't yell at you. 30 percent, you'll get a phone. You're gonna hear, hear about it, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I will go to, oh, yes. So this is the solar generated. So if that amount of solar that was is generated from all of their panels, if it was equivalent to an amount of homes that can power, um, this this is what it is for each year. So all together, it's like the equivalent of powering 587 homes from solar. So that amount of homes are using, yeah, it's kind of a way to think about it. And if you are have a hard time with the other numbers, um, We did look into wind energy too, and we found that to be a lot more restrictive than doing solar. And then this is just one little last um, slide here. They shared with me that, because I asked, well, you know, we were wondering what these, the savings kind of can do for the future, and you guys are actually investing in more solar. And you showed me this location here next to the city shop and you plan, was it a retirement home you plan on putting there? Mm -hmm. Elderly housing, middle income, something like that. It faces south, so there will be solar power on it. I'll guarantee you that. All right. Well, and the city has done other um, projects like uh, we have switched a lot of our buildings to LED lights. Um, and we did get the rebates for the LED conversion. Um, we do have programmable thermostats here at City Hall. And um, with adjustments to those, our electric costs have kind of gone down a little and not um, increased even with, even though energy increases, our electric costs have kind of been flatlined just by using programmable thermostats and LED lights. So um, the, the staff has been working hard to, to be energy efficient and to lower our footprint.
we were Thank very you, lucky that we could just go ahead and purchase these solar arrays outright. But we did look into the power purchase agreement and it just didn't work for us. But I think it's important for people to remember that that only works as long as the tax deductions are there. If for some reason those tax deductions go away, then I think you're going to see the power purchase agreements go away. Well, yeah, that's that's exactly right, and a very good point, Steve. Most most city entities, most non-taxable entities, are not sitting on, are, are not um, financially uh, positioned in order to just finance solar outright, and and so this the power purchase agreement scheme works very very well, but they it only makes sense when there's a tax credit. Otherwise, um, the, it's just you're not going to find that third party investor um, to to invest in a project like that. Um, so the, you, 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 st you stole my thunder there. That's exactly the, the case. Um, the tax credits and that's why we have um, our state and um, state candidates um, to, to sort of explain to them again the importance of the state tax credits as well as the federal tax credits. Um, Without them, without those incentives, um, we are not going to see this investment in solar. And what we're really seeing here is, you know, um, solar is strengthening our communities. We just heard from um, uh, from Marquette and the city of West Union. All of those towns are 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 winning by spending less on energy. They're able to free up their expenses, um, their their capital to invest in other city projects to make for stronger communities. Um, so I I I am so impressed with with Marquette and their initiatives. I, they're the best story that I think um, you you all tell is is when you went back to council after attending the workshop and. Put it up there and i think you i think bonnie you said you had a council person that really was resistant and really um questioned the wisdom investing in solar and it took nine months of deliberation is that right uh, it seemed like nine it was probably like four i bet nine months for the sewer plant okay um but uh, four for the initial the initial project and i did have somebody look at me and say what why did you even look into this you know we didn't ask you to look into this why are you checking this out but then when they realized the savings the neck it was like just like night and day then they're like oh can we save money here can we save money here yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um and i think that that you had the one resistor and then now in future projects that person was that council person was able to see the benefits see, t see the return on investment and it's sort of yeah, like let's let's do it. Um, yep, leading the charge. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for for Marquette officials? I, I have just one. I'm curious as you look at various projects um, for solar, uh, are there situations where the return would not justify the investment ever? We we did have um, one of our other wells. Um, we are in the middle of bluff country, kind of. So one of our other wells is kind of shaded, and they did look at it, and it just wasn't really cost effective to do that project. There's just not enough sun in that location. So really, sun is the is the only thing that would really hamper cost effectiveness. Correct. Yep. Correct. Yep. Okay. Okay. And any project that we looked at, you just contact Eagle Point Solar, give them the information on your electric use, they come out, they look at the site and they will tell you if it's feasible or not. Okay. So that was what I would, that was what I was intuiting from this, but I just wondered, yeah. It, it's a great question. And um, another story that goes right, right along with that is um, uh, the Wakan school um, is, what is that? Alamakee, Alamakee County or Community School District. They were looking at putting solar um, on the Wacon High School. And um, one of the barriers that has kept them from investing in solar there and in school districts are in a, in a kind of a unique situation in that they have um, what are called categorical funds, meaning they have a pebble fund that's um, property taxes that are collected and they have to spend it on infrastructure. So sometimes school districts are seeing 
kind of larger budgets that have to that in uh, accumulating funds i should say in in their infrastructure funds so wakan really was looking to solar power their school because one of the great things about um uh PPAs or just are not even PPAs but solar investments I should say is if they could pay for the solar outright and then when they go to pay their power bills they do that through general funds so if they have reduced um, power bills then they have more again for their mission and they're able to use it within to, to pay teachers or um, to enhance school directly. What I was going to say, though, is that Wacom was na not able to consider um, the solar power there because of a site limitation. So one of the things that we're working on um, and advocating for with the Iowa Utilities Bill, as the um, investor-owned utilities are putting their tariffs um, before the uh, um, Iowa Utility Board, is to consider what is called meter aggregation, so that a lot of these, um, you know, multi um, uh, operations that have multi meters, if they could con consolidate meters, have one meter and then put the solar somewhere on their campus or within their operation so that they're not, they're not governed by that um, site limitation. So um, net meter or um, meter aggregation is something that could really kind of lift the lid on where there are sites that are kind of limiting. Um, so and, that kind of ties into the other question I had, which is, um, limitations by the proximity of the array versus where it's going. Right. So, yes. Yeah, so, it, it, right now, you have to have your solar, if you're going to power a building, it has to be somewhere on that property. Um, but if this, again, in this idea of community owned solar and solar powering um, municipalities, if you could put solar in a field somewhere and you had one meter for that entity, then that would work. Yeah. So, okay. it, so the same thing on a church campus. If if you yeah. if you got a large campus and you could put solar on the south end, but you only you got to get to the meter. And if there's multiple meters, it's got to power that. It's got to serve the one meter. So we're we're fans of what's called meter aggregation. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. I have a question. So right now the, the ITC credits are coupled with the state credits. So right. as the ITC credits decline, which is they're heading that direction, the state credits also decline. So do you folks feel that if we decouple them at the state level, that there'd be enough incentive to keep the PPAs moving forward? Correct, yeah. So that's, that's a great question, Mike. Thanks for that. Yes, the, the energy districts and um, the solar industry in general are really, really advocating for in the state of Iowa to decouple those tax credits so that they will be able to, again, um, if we could restore the credits to that 15% is what they were. So in 2018, 20, yeah, so 2019, the, the full tax credit, the federal IT, ITC credit was 30%, coupled with the state at 15. Um, and um, and then they began to tear back. And so now it's 26 at the 26 at the federal and 13 at the state. So yes, we would we would advocate for those being restored to 15%. Um, let me see, I think we've got, since the credits have been issued, um, there have been $4.5 million of the 20, there's a $5 million annual cap. And as of March 26 of 2020, 450, 4.5 million of that 5 million cap has already been spent. So there's a huge waiting line. And so if we were able to decouple it and restore the cap to that five to that five million and pay out that waiting line, it would really, really increase um, the investments in solar. So yeah, it's a great question. In in Iowa, there have been as of just as of 2018, there were 850 jobs. Um, that are related to the solar industry. And that number has only grown. But as the tax credits begin to tear back, um, the incentive is not going to be there. And so we really, it's, it's, it's just at the time where we need to continue incentivizing that, that um, industry. One more question, if you don't mind. So being mayor of a small town, looking at municipalities, has anybody explored the possibility or option of having municipalities establish, uh, let's say, uh, a co-op themselves? where they can filter the tax credits back to the residents of the towns instead of using PPAs with outside investors. I mean, granted Marquette was in a financial position to cash flow everything up front, 
let's say that your city was or close to it, but you wanted to give direct benefit of the tax credits back to the property owners that lived in your city. Are there roadblocks that prohibit that? Has anybody explored those options? Because that really gets everybody vested at a local level to, to move forward with solar. And maybe it's, maybe it's a question way out there, but I, I just wanted to ask it anyway. No, it's a really good question. So for, for sure, the municipal utilities are perfectly poised for that. So in Clayton County, um, Guttenberg, McGregor and Strawberry all have municipal utilities, municipal owned utilities. So they're perfectly poised for this idea of putting community owned solar um, because they're, 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 buying the, they're buying their kilowatts somewhere. Why not make them on their own and really, again, community owned and really maintain those uh, tax rates or those uh, utility rates at almost nothing um, if they were to generate that. So municipal owned utilities are well, are, are well poised for that. Um, as far as forming their own co-ops, I don't think that um, Iowa um, utilities law would allow something like that. Um, but the idea of the power purchase agreement is um, just that. Uh, the, 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 it's a third party that actually is generating the power, the owner of those solar power, uh, solar arrays is actually that third party um, utility. But uh, the way monopoly utilities are in Iowa, either you, do, you, either you go through a municipalization project and you form your own municipal utility, the city of Decorah went through that. It's very onerous, it's very difficult to do. And the investor owned utility are not eager to all of them lose all of those customers. Um, but you, you know, as far as communities investing in solar on their own, yeah, the municipal utilities can can do that any day. And so that's why we're trying to tell these stories of what happened in Marquette um, and in West Union. What, <clears throat> could I'm, I'm sorry to keep going. Could it be beneficial for cities? instead of looking at just creating their own utility system, could it be beneficial to have something listed in the state code that would allow them to, let's say, develop solar fields, not necessarily become a municipal utility themselves, but then channel some of that benefit back to the residents? I'm just looking at getting folks invested at a local level. Oh, to... I see what you're saying. Right now, Iowa code does not allow that, but the, okay, I, I, now I get what you're saying. So the city of Osage, um, has their has again, this is a municipal utility, but that is exactly what they do. Not everybody wants to put up rooftop solar. So they have a huge solar farm and and um, customers of that utility are able to buy a certain number of panels from the Osage solar farm. And then they whatever that whatever those panels produce, that's their power and and they have a they have a, a kind of a complicated formula, but they are able to credit whatever solar power is generated on the panels that they own that aren't on the roof, but are owned out on the solar farm. So that's that's real community owned solar. Are those folks able to capture the tax credits then for the, let's say they own six solar panels. Are they able to ta capture any sort of tax no, credits individually? I, oh gosh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I would say no, um, but I'm, n yeah, what a really good question. I do not know the answer. I, I'm going to say- it would take a code change to allow them to be able to capture at the very least the Iowa tax credit on those solar panels they owned in that particular field, correct? Correct, yes. I, I would think it would take a code change. Um, well, and to be clear, like with the with a net metering thing at play for that municipal, for a municipal electric utility that has people owning, they can sort of, um, you know, make that accessible to people. But if you're trying to do that with Alliant or a different utility, you can't have the panels off site. So you wouldn't necessarily even be able to apply those. Oh, no, exactly. Et cetera. Um, that, that's, ex yeah, that's exactly right, Kayla. So we're talking about two different things. So municipal municipally owned solar farms, I don't know the answer whether or not they can take advantage of their tax credit, but they can set up any net metering policy they want to set up um, within a municipal utility. For example, the energy district helped the city of Guttenberg just actually set up a, a, a decent net metering interconnection and net metering um, policy that was not onerous to the residents of Guttenberg. But the investor owned utilities, yes, right now, if you're going to put up a large array of solar and farm that and, and allow that, no, they, they can't do that um, off, off site. So Marquette cannot put a solar farm up and, and start selling panels to their residents because they're served by Alliant. 
Um, so yeah, it, it, yeah, I think that I hope I'm not making it more muddy, but yeah. All right. Any more questions? It's really interesting. <laughs> Okay. Well, if you guys think of any uh, regarding the solar, just we'll we'll open it back up again after um, this next topic. So we'll go on to. Thanks, Bonnie and Steve. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, that was a really great conversation. So, we'll the the next topic is the electric transportation and. Clayton County tourism sector. And so Jolene will be helping give this presentation along with our chair, Jim Osterhaus. Yeah. So, you know, the, the clean energy transition is going to take a lot of, um, it, there's, there's a lot of moving parts to a clean energy transition and strengthening communities at a local level. Um, again, the, the, whole, the whole idea is, is that when we spend less on our energy bills, um, less uh, dollars leave our community and stay in our communities, strengthening them um, uh, by, by spending less on the energy bills. Um, so one of the, one of the deals that, one of the things that are, that's important to that process is that not only, you know, when we think about using um, the clean energy transition, using clean energy, we have to consider the idea of electrification. So we talk a lot about this idea of making sure that we include everyone in the process and then electrifying everything and then decarbonizing electricity. So where, where if we were to, where one of the biggest um, uh, uses of energy is through transportation. And so the electrification of transportation is, is something that um, we see as, I think is a big part of the clean energy transition. So Clayton County happens to be uh, an uh, EV charging station desert. There are, there are no um, charging stations save one in Clayton County. So let's look at the next slide so I can know where I'm going here. Oh, and so the, the energy district has, done a, has thought a lot about that and in, in, in how do we actually get charging stations into Clayton County. And so we were able to propose a grant to the Upper Mississippi Gaming Corporation and were successfully funded um, connecting EV charging to tourism. So I think on the next, so this is a map of, um, go back one, one just a minute there, Ashley, sorry. Um, this, is a, this is a map by county of the number of arrivals in 2019. So, uh, and we'll send out this, um, this, this uh, graph um, after the meeting, but it was um, provided to us by uh, Clayton County Economic Development um, uh, Director. And it shows that Clayton County um, in our part of Northeast Iowa has a, really a lot of arrivals compared to the surrounding counties, only to the Northeast and Winnesheek County do they top us, but compared to Alamakee, um, Fayette, uh, Buchanan and um, Delaware, we're well over um, uh, 75,000 more arrivals. So Clayton County is a tour. I mean, this is just showing, you can go to the next slide now, Ashley, they're just showing how um, Clayton County is dependent on the tourism sector. Um, in, in the year uh, from 2019, July 19 to 20, we received the Clayton County Economic Development Office research, re, uh, received uh, 10,000 um, brochure requests for what, what, if we come to Clayton County, what's there to do? And so they, re they responded to 10,000 requests. Um, Lindsay, uh, who is the economic development director over in um, uh, Lindsay Martin in, in Strawberry Point, um, in, in which is where one of these charging stations is going, um, sees that at the, at the intersection of Highway 3 and 13 in Strawberry, they see 2,800 cars a day um, at that intersection. And as I mentioned earlier in 2019, the arrivals were um, in um, Clayton County were 206,000. And um, Clayton County of the 11 scenic byways um, in the state of Iowa is ranked second um, as far as most scenic byway and Al McKee has the first scenic byway. So there's a reason to um, consider um, electric vehicle charging stations for Clayton County. 
think on the next slide, um, it shows this desert. So if, if you have an electric vehicle, and we're gonna show you a couple electric vehicles in a little bit, you are going, you know, I, I own a, a, an all electric vehicle and Jim, our board chair does as well. You, you know, I, if, if, if you can get to where you're going and back um, and charge at home, you, you, it's fine. But if you're going to travel, um, you need to uh, be able to charge that somewhere or you're, you're not going further. And so if you own electric vehicles, the first thing you do if you start planning trips is you say, where are the charging stations? Um, if, if somebody wants to come up to, um, from let's say Des Moines and they wanna make, come up to Clayton County for a weekend, um, if there are no charging stations, they're not going, and they own an electric vehicle, they're not going to come to Clayton County. So um, I think the next slide um, shows that there is one charging station currently in Clayton County, and it sits um, between the service bays um, at Brown's, Shover, at Brown's um, uh, sales and leasing. So that's out at Brown's in El Cater. That's the only place in all of Clayton County where somebody can go and um, from the public and, and charge their vehicle. If they go out there to charge their vehicle, I think most of you know where Browns is. It's not on the, it's a little off the beaten path. It's not just a, you know, a stone throw to the downtown district. Um, it's not a particularly, um, uh, it's my word, uh, enticing place to sit and charge your car. So um, as of right now, there is no charging stations in Clayton County and the energy district recognized that. And so we applied for a grant um, with, the um, Upper Mississippi Gaming Corps. Um, and, and just one more stat before I go on that according to autonews.com by 2025, EVs, electric vehicles will account for one third of global auto sales. Um, and uh, that uh, there'll be more, more EVs and by 2030, there'll be more EV sales than there will be internal combustion engine cars. So um, we're talking in, in one decade, most of us will be buying new electric vehicles as opposed to um, fossil fuel burning um, cars. So electric cars can range right, right now at present about 200 miles um, before they need a charge. So we, like I said, recognized that desert um, and applied to the um, Upper, Mississippi, Upper Mississippi Gaming Corps um, and were awarded um, a grant to put up five uh, dual port level two um, uh, charging stations, They'll, they have the capacity to charge at 19.2 kilowatts. That's the largest level two uh, charger that's on the market right now. And they have the potential to charge your vehicle up to 80 miles an hour. Um, so next slide. Uh, this is the charging stations that we're going to be overseeing um, put into Clayton County. It's a, like I said, it's a blink charging station. The pedestal on the left is exactly what the charging stations in Clayton County will look like. If you wanna to go to the next slide. That's, um, so we're looking at the mayors, um, that's Mayor H H Hannah Evans over in Strawberry. And that is the site where they're gonna put their charging station. I believe it's on Commercial Street. And it's the site of where they're going to put up a, um, a veterans memorial and some green space. And then the charging station will be there. And it's again, just, People will be able to plug in right there. It's right um, near their downtown district. Um, so that's in Strawberry. In El Cater, they're gonna put theirs out just um, adjacent to Founders Park. Um, and, uh, and, and there's plenty of parking there. So that'll be a great place to charge as well. The next one is in Guttenberg and that's um, Mayor Frommel and um, their new um, economic development director, Emily uh, Yadoff. And, uh, our chair in the background there um, is Jim Osterhaus, and they're um, still deciding on location, but there are two locations in Guttenberg that they're considering. One is on the highway where they may be building a new um, welcome center, or it'll go on River Park Drive. And then in McGregor, that's Mayor um, Bowman there, and they also are putting their charging station, and you got to put them somewhere where they can um, get to um, get get to the um, uh, uh, electricity. So that is, I believe, um, just over the uh, dike in downtown McGregor. And then the last one is in Marquette, and um, that also is near a park, and again, a, a perfect walking distance to downtown um, um, amenities. 
So um, again, this idea of having um, EV charging um, in your um, tourism um, uh, destinations is, is really important. This is, these are a couple pictures just of a trip that I made. Um, our, my husband and I went over to see our son in Milwaukee two weeks ago. Um, it was the longest trip that we went on with our electric vehicle. Again, it's not a gas assist. It is a, it's not a hybrid, it's an all electric vehicle. And so we had to um, use the, the charging maps and plan our trip out um, and figure out where we were going to be able to charge because it is 200 and I think it's about a 260 mile trip from door, our door to, to his, um, his door. So we needed to charge on the way. And, you know, we get 200 miles on fair weather days, but um, when it gets a little bit colder, then that shrinks that mileage range a little bit. Um, and if you want to stay warm in your car um, or cool in your car, that also uses some of the battery. And so we had to plan these charge, plan our, stop, our trip based on where the charging um, stations were. Um, okay. Is there another slide after that, Ashley? Um, okay, so I think we're gonna let Jim, Jim has got his um, vehicle ready to go that he's gonna give you just a tour of his Tesla. Are you there, Jim? Give him a second to, are you turning? Okay. You'll have to there start my video. All right, I will. There we go. So, okay. Okay, here I am. I'm in my garage right now. I'm just, just getting an idea of, of we had to put up a, uh, a 240 volt line in order to charge my vehicle. And uh, I can't turn around because my wife told me, do not show the inside of our garage. So, uh, I'm going outside. I have a Tesla, and uh, I have the, the the because there's no motor. I have a pretty spacious front trunk, as really, well as really quickly, Jim. I'm just going to ask: Can everyone see his car in the bigger screen, or is it still stuck on my screen? It's still stuck on yours, Ashley. Um, let me. Should work if I stop. I will stop. There you go. Okay, there we go. Are we on? Yep, you're good. Okay, and again, this this is the front trunk because there's no engine. There's there's lots of space here, and uh, uh, going back to my my pick my comment on the uh, charging station, uh, I prefer to charge at home. I have solar panels on the roof of my house and that, that helps fund driving my car. Uh, and that, it, it can take about, if, if I'm really low, it can take four to five hours to charge my car um, at home. If, if I go to a Tesla charging station, anywhere, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour is enough to, to charge it up. And that's for a 300 mile range. Uh, and like Jolene said, you have to plan your trips. Uh, and uh, the car tells me when I better get, get it charged. Here's the rear trunk. And, uh, and, and then uh, that's kind of it. Actually, there's another trunk under this one. So there's just a lot of, a huge amount of space. Everything, Everything is on one one screen, as you can see. And I'll just a second. There we go. The picture here shows all the batteries are on the floor, so it's incredibly stable when you're driving in wind or turning, going, going around corners. But uh, let's see. It uh, again, it charges in about four to five hours if it's low. You don't want to run the car, the battery really low. It's hard on on the lithium ion bat batteries to get below twenty percent or over eighty percent. Um, this one has dual motors. I went with dual motors because 
in Iowa, you have it's otherwise it would have just been front wheel drive. And in Iowa, you really it it seems to function better if you have rear wheel drive. Um, there is also an auto steer function where you, you have to keep your hands on the wheel or it'll stop, but it'll drive you, it'll go around corners, and if you put your signal light, it'll pass other vehicles and and change lanes and check to make sure there's no vehicle there are no vehicles in your blind spot and it'll change lanes go around the car and resume your your uh, uh, cruise control speed um, now it how how efficient it is I'm depending on the price of gasoline and the price of electricity I can get between 80 miles per gallon equivalent of gas up to 150 miles of equivalent so it, it's very uh, um, very fuel efficient as you as you can see um, I guess um, the the range anxiety is probably the biggest problem with electric vehicles and the they're dealing with battery technology uh, every practically every week you can see a new a study group who comes out with a, a new battery type and uh, I think once they get these vehicles up or up over 500 mile range uh, after 500 miles you're probably ready to take a nap or or, or stop for the day um, 300 miles as Jolene said if it's cold and you have the uh, if you're driving into the wind if you're doing a lot of hills if you're uh, uh, if, if it's cold or hot outside and you're running the heater or air conditioner, that's going to use your mileage and you have to calculate that in. So again, range anxiety is probably your your biggest worry. So um, that's, and, and just, just an aside, if you've never felt one of these things accelerate, you'll, you'll be absolutely shocked at how fast they can accelerate. But anyway, that's my presentation. If anybody has any questions, um, I'd be happy to take them. Jim, how long does your lithium batteries last in your car? Um, well, they, they actually warranty them for seven years at 90% uh, of, of maximum, but but they've got some of the, the Model X's and S's have been out for 10 plus years and they haven't had to replace any. So it's a, oh, I see. You got me on there, no? So it, it, replacing them, again, it, it'll cost anywhere from seven to $10,000 to replace them. But uh, they've got vehicles now that have a million miles on them and they have not had to replace their batteries. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Does anyone else have any questions for Jim? Otherwise, I think Jolene's going to give a tour of hers. So, so Jim was showing you his Tesla. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you, but just can't see you. Can you see the... Um, Janssen products, yep. Oh, you should be able to see the car now. No. You want to spotlight me? Yeah, that's probably what's. Oh, I. Um, let me. There we go. All right. So you can see the car and you can hear me. Yep. So, okay, great. So this is, this is our new um, Chevy um, Bolt. Jim, Jim showed you a Tesla. And um, I, the reason why I wanted to show you our car, and it, it's here in, in our garage. Um, we also are solar powered here. So we, we power, we, we charge during the day. This is our charger. You can see um, the charger on the wall there and it plugs in there. And then this little light here shows us that it's actually fully charged right now. But the, the Chevy Bolt is um, a car that we bought here. Actually, we bought it at um, Decora Chevrolet. Uh, I wanted to buy it here in Clayton County because I'm, I'm all about local and um, 
um, trying to strengthen our local community. But a, a, as it is right now, um, you, I couldn't buy this car here in Ocator new um, in order to sell um, EV vehicles, um, new EV vehicles off your lot. You, a Chevy requires you to have a certified technician and um, they, do, they don't have one right now. So they can sell used, um, but the deal on this car new was too good to pass up. Um, so it, it, the sticker price on it was somewhere around, um, I think 39,000, which was not something that, that um, we could consider. Uh, but because uh, we bought it at the end of the year and because there is um, a, a tax credit on it, our actual sticker price on this um, our outlay on it was $21,000. So it's an all electric vehicle. Um, we will not, um, we don't um, put gas in it, um, obviously. We uh, will never change the oil in it because there is no, in, no um, engine to, to take care of. Um, so the thing, the cost, the annual cost on this or the, the maintenance on this is actually just what any car needs is tires. Um, so we save in, in service and maintenance. Um, we are able to charge with our, um, our solar panels. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then when we go beyond our range and can't get back here with it, then we obviously, we gotta find those charging um, stations and the need for that infrastructure. I think some of the things that I really, um, I, one, I've never owned a new car, so that's kind of cool, but for um, $22,000 or 21,000 actually with the tax credit, um, that's about the range um, of, you know, any kind of new car right now. It's pretty roomy, um, has a hatchback, so I really enjoy that. It's an especially quiet car um, because there is no running engine. Um, and I think that's all I really have to say about the, um, the Bolt. So I'm going to go back inside, unless anybody has any questions or would like to see, I can show you the inside of the car. Um, so yeah, I mean, just Jolene. Yeah, you you made mention about the uh, uh, the networks, charge point, plug share, and and blink mm -hmm. networks that are available. Mm -hmm. Oh oh yeah, so um, there are various charging networks. So in order to find your, um, I kind of short circuited that conversation too on the charging station. So. One of the things that um, can, what we did in order to put these charging stations in um, the various communities in Clayton County was to, um, first of all, they're all putting up 25% cost share. So they're getting about $16,000 in equipment um, for a quarter of the price. And then each of these charging um, stations will immediately go on to the um, EV charging maps. The overarching map is called plug share or application, <clears throat> excuse me, is plug share. And then um, we're using, um, we, we went with Blink. They, we put it out for bid and they came in, um, um, they, they won the bid. So we're using the Blink charging network, um, uh, but each of there's charge point, there's green lots, there's all kinds of um, charging networks. And they all um, are um, Wi-Fi enabled, meaning that um, in order to find those charging stations, you, you use these applications. You can even use the application to find out if that charging station is, um, uh, if, the, if it's available or if it's in use. Uh, yeah, so does that answer that question, Jim, the, the networks? Yes. Okay. All right, uh, so I'm gonna head back in, um, get back on camera here. I'll, I'll be right back. Uh, maybe you guys can start with some questions. Okay, does anyone have any questions to anybody, to Jim or um, Jolene or anything more going back to the solar or um, the, the energy efficiency with the church. I just got a quick question on the uh, uh, AmeriCorps workers, Green Iowa. How have they uh, coordinated with Clayton County's uh, efforts? 
Oh, sorry, Mike. So I'm, I might, I might have missed the question. What was it? He was uh, wondering about um, the Green Iowa AmeriCorps and how they're co correlated with our efforts. Yeah. So um, the Green Iowa AmeriCorps um, team has been instrumental in um, the work that we've done within the Clayton County Energy District. We've done um, our, somewhere in the neighborhood of 175 home energy audits in Clayton County. Uh, the energy, the Green Isle AmeriCorps team comes in, they um, put set up a blower door test uh, on every household that um, requests an energy efficiency audit. Um, uh, they will do a blower door test that looks for airflow. They'll test all of the fossil fuel burning appliances for um, safety. And then they'll do whole household LED transitions as well as um, uh, put low flow water aerators on faucets and on um, uh, the shower heads. We are not doing any in-person audits right now during the um, pandemic. Uh, so we are actually teaming with Green Iowa in, in different ways. One of them is we're planning to implement a, um, we got a little grant from the Alan McKee Clayton REC and we're going to be doing a, um, uh, a, fifth grade curriculum, kind of, are you smarter than a fifth grader? And we're going to um, go and do Zoom meetings with fifth grade um, science classes, educate them on LED technology, and then we will um, deliver bulbs to the um, schools for those fifth grade families, um, for the families of the fifth graders, and then have them go home and educate their parents on the idea of LED technology. The Clayton County Energy District is taking the LED um, adoption very, um, very seriously and we're pretty aggressive of trying to get our county to do a full LED adoption. You know, the LEDs, if you're on the coast, California or the East Coast or the West Coast, you don't, you don't talk about what kind of light bulbs you might use or why you might use them. Um, but in the Midwest, the, the, the technology and the advantage of the technology and the energy savings related to it is just not fully adopted. And so um, between using Green Isle AmeriCorps teams um, to do whole household LED transitions and us doing LED trans, um, swaps um, at permanent swap stations like at the food show, um, we also are doing, like I said, this program this fall with fifth graders um, in the in trying to do the best that we can to stay relevant um, and, to, and facilitate the transition. But that's how we're using Green Isle AmeriCorps right now. Does anyone else have any questions? Jolene, this is Matt Tapscott. Um, the other energy districts around the state, do they have similar, I'm assuming, success stories to tell? Oh, they do, um, it, especially the Winnesheek Energy District, um, which was, um, it's been in existence. They're celebrating their 10th, 10-year um, anniversary right now. And so they're the, they're the founding energy district and they have, um, uh, you know, just extreme success stories. I mean, they, they have in this, um, they, per capita, they don't have a lot of publicly owned solar, but they've got um, an amazing amount of locally owned solar. In fact, um, they, they in Washington, Iowa, lead the state of Iowa as far as per capita solar arrays. Um, that has returned millions and millions of dollars to their community that doesn't flow out in energy costs, it stays in. Um, but the Dubuque County Energy District um, has also has um, quite a bit of claims to fame um, as far as um, inspiring solar investments, inspiring um, energy efficiency projects. Um, there's a, an energy district in Howard County. Howard County happens to be the site of one of the first publicly um, powered um, city infrastructure projects because of the PPA um, agreement that was settled and won at the Supreme Court. Actually, um, Eagle Point Solar was one of the, um, uh, 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 they testified in that case and were able to um, uh, win at the Supreme Court the, the um, PPA agreement so that we could have third parties um, actually um, own and sell electricity. And so Howard County is um, led by Amy Busca, who is um, a city council person. Um, she leads the Howard County Energy District. And so they have really inspired and done a lot of um, clean energy work there as well. 
Now there's a count, there's an energy district in Lynn County and in Johnson County, and we'll be doing tours in all of those. Um, but yes, I mean, all of it's about, there are local clean energy champions everywhere and everybody has a different story to, um, to tell and different projects to work on, but yeah. Um, I you know, I, I, just real quickly, um, thank you for the opportunity. This has been amazing, as was it in West Union when you did that tour. You know, some a number of us sitting in this meeting are going to be in positions of, of making decisions in a couple of months to really impact this. And, you know, the care for our common home, that's what this is all about. It's to replicate this model all across the state, to replicate these success stories all across the state. It's really the political will to do that. I mean, that's what I'm hearing today as we, yeah, there's an economic savings, but there's also the carbon footprint and the caring for our common home. That the driving force is behind that and just to have the political will, whoever of us are sitting in those seats in a couple months. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's a win-win. We talk about it with, within the energy district circles. We talk about when, um, when you when green meets green, the idea of clean energy, prosperity, and climate stewardship, it's a win-win. Um, and so there are many, I mean, if, if you can't convince somebody, it's, a, it's something that we can all agree on, is that um, it, it's, it's savings, um, economic savings, and it's also a, a reduction in our in our um, carbon footprint, and 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 if it, and so there's no there's really not a lot of room for dis for disagreement. The idea is is you know there's not a lot of reasons to spend spend a lot of money and energy and in dirty energy on top of it when we can reduce what we need to use and we can use you know cleaner technologies. I had a quick question. Um, just, it sounds like some of the barriers and opportunities that we've heard throughout the session, you know, one of the barriers being access to capital for some of these public entities or non-taxable entities. Um, and the solution so far for that is the PPA and the tax credits and, and what happens to them in the future is gonna make an impact on whether this is possible for NTs. So that seems like one barrier with at least a partial solution at this present time. Um, and the other one that you talked about was uh, how the code and the utilities allow people to set up their renewable installations and, and whether it has to be right at the meter or whether it can be offsite or whether um, it can be at a meter that aggregates the power usage for multiple meter sites. So that seems like another barrier that um, is making it more difficult for whether it's homeowners or farmers or, or non-taxable entities to, to make sure they have the siting. Are there other barriers that um, that we didn't discuss today that that you want to to see the state address? Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, there are a couple other ones. Um, there are two. One in, in the area of, of energy efficiency, and um, you know we we didn't talk a lot about um, the idea. The pillar of the energy districts. One of the pillars is inclusivity, including everyone. There are so many Iowans, especially now in the time of, um, of the pandemic, um, the, the most vulnerable parts of our population that are really experiencing a lot of energy burden. And so Senate file 2311 um, that passed in 2018 has really set up a, a, a very, just an onerous situation where there are no dollars and no incentives um, available or really, excuse me, I shouldn't say it like that. It's just completely cut the energy efficiency fund. Um, and, and so one of the things that, that energy districts are really advocating for is restoration of some of that funding at minimum for the weatherization assistance program. Well, the Green Iowa AmeriCorps team does do a lot of that work, but their fund, uh, well, ex excuse me, the CAP agencies are administering the weatherization assistance program. Um, but they are, they are, their number of homes that those community action um, uh, groups can actually do has been just severely kneecapped. Those weatherization programs are keeping people in their homes. And so at minimum, we'd like to see weatherization um, assistance um, program funding restored and a raise of the, of the um, energy efficiency surcharge tax uh, caps just from their way down at 2% and just increase them a little bit so that we can have some more energy efficiency programming. 
On the idea of the electric electric vehicles, there um, is an excise tax. There is a uh, there are two things that were passed by the legislature in 2019, and one of them is an excise tax that will go into effect in 2022. Obviously, electric vehicles are not paying um, uh, fuel tax. Uh, they're not going to gas stations to charge. And so they have to pay, you know, if you're owning an electric vehicle, it doesn't mean that you're using the road system any, any less. So we certainly need to um, pay our fair share to, um, because to, to support the, the, trans, the um, transportation, um, to support the road system, the infrastructure needed to get from one place to another. So, but one of the things that is uh, um, kind of particularly onus regarding it, so the registration fee is one thing. Um, by 2022, every electric vehicle will pay an additional $130 to register their vehicle, um, but they're already paying high registration fees already because electric vehicles cost more. So the registration costs is um, um, already high and then an additional $130 fee, which is Fair, but it's particular. It's it's possible that it's disproportionate. So it would be better that you pay the registration fee based on miles driven. But the other thing that I think is going to really, really roadblock um, the uh, the build out of EV infrastructure is the sales tax that will be assessed. That um, EV charging station um, operators will be required to um, collect starting in 2022. So if you have an EV charging station on a hotel or at, um, at City Hall or um, in, within the community, at, at an employer, that kind of thing, all of these, um, and you'll see that, you'll see as we build out the, as we, more pe people start using EV vehicles, there are going to be more employers, more businesses that are gonna put up EV vehicle uh, charging stations as, a, um, as an amenity for their customers or their employers. Um, and if they have to collect sales tax on a really small amount of um, uh, sales in the year, th they probably will end up ripping those charging stations out. Certainly the, the charging stations, the fast charging stations that you see on, on, along major thoroughfares on the interstate and, and at um, where there already are fueling stations, that makes sense. They're, they're already set up to collect that sales tax. But the small EV charging stations that we're showing you that we're, we're building out here in Clayton County, if they have to collect sales tax, I'm afraid they'll get, they'll get pulled out. So yeah, the, those three things then, weatherization assistance funding, the idea to uh, decouple the sales, uh, the investor, the solar tax credits from the, st from the federal at the state level, keep the min um, restore that um, credit to 15%. And then, um, take off the sales, the onerous sales tax, um, excise tax on EV charging stations in the community would be the three, would be those, the, the three points. And if I might and, add, if I might add, there's also county and, and municipal ordinances that need to be updated in order to allow for uh, um, solar arrays. Have, have you had much experience with the alternate energy revolving loan fund? Have you had any clients that have that have tapped that funding stream provided by the state? And have you, if they have, have you seen any roadblocks or anything that would make it detrimental and not easy to use? You know, we. I think you brought that up, Mike. I, I remember that question. I I do not. I I feel bad. I I meant to go and look into that. I don't know the answer to that, but I have not. I don't know of any entities that have used that state revolving loan fund. Um, makes sense. There. There have been some limitations on the revolving loan fund. Um, the legislature did pass some kind of blocks to access to that. And I have no idea if city entities have the opportunity to tap into it for solar investments. Well, we're we're a little bit past where the, our end point, you guys. I'm very sorry um, for taking you past, but I am so thrilled that you were all able to take the time to join us and learn a little bit more about our our local effort here in Clayton County um, to strengthen our communities by um, leading the energy transition. Uh, very much appreciate your time. We are going to send some follow up materials. Um, 
it's particularly highlighting the the, the um, policy <laughs> points that we've discussed in in why they could make a difference at the state level um, in 2021. Yep, so I'll be sending an email out to the guests or to all of you um, that attended with that handouts folder with that extra information. And yeah, I just wanna thank you guys also for coming. This was a really great conversation. So, and we do, just so you know too, we have our website, claytoncounty.energydistrict.org. We really try to keep everything that has happened most recently updated on there. We'll do like a blog post of it. And then we also like to share it to our social media. So you can definitely stay caught up with us in that way too. All, All right. right. Thank, Thank you. you guys. All right. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.